Um, I must say, it's lovely to see so many of you here this morning. Thank you for coming. Um, so my talk is about, as Noel said, about 10 kinds of equanimity, um, which um, I, it, it comes from a list of 10 kinds of equanimity that Buddha Gosa put together in the Fasuda Magga. And he also used it in the Expositor, which is um, a, a commentary that goes alongside the first book of the Dhammasangani. And this is where um, I came across it because I was studying Abhidhamma at the time, the, um, the Dhamma Sangani, and um, I still am, but um, it's about two years ago now. And it was very interesting, I thought, because where he brought in um, his, his 10 kinds of uh, upeka was um, just at the point when the Dhamma Sangani is exploring or analyzing, setting out the um, skillful mind states that are present in the development and practice of jhana. And specifically, we were up to third jhana. And, um, and in the commentary, Buddha Gosa says, and in this jhana, there, are, there is a peka. And then he seems to go off on this little funny tangent as kind of route map through 10 kinds of um, opaca that I'm, you know, moving away from jhana, really. Um, and then it, at the end of the 10, there's a little bit of a, uh, an example of what they all are, and comes back and says, but today we're looking at upeka in third jhana. And I thought, oh, that's very interesting. <laughs> I'm quite interested in this. And it, I just was fascinated, really. I just wanted to look into it a little bit more. Why did he put that there? And what were these 10 kinds anyway? Um, so I, I started looking into them um, and I have been on and off ever since really. And it's been quite a delightful journey. But I mean, in the process of that, you know, I, I remember thinking, we don't talk about Upeka that much. It comes up as part of a list, other lists, because it's all it's in so many places, key places uh, in, the, in the teaching. Um, but then I thought, well, yeah, actually you can't really separate it out in a way because it always arises out of um, the, the, the other states, the development of the other states that have uh, led to it, really. So, however, I did look into it. And, um, and it's been, and you know, what I've found as well is that when you take one little aspect of Dhamma, and you put the spotlight on that and, and go in through that, that route, you, it, all the other stuff always comes up, but you kind of see it in a different perspective. And that's what I found very interesting as well. Um, so let's begin um, by looking at um, Buddha Gosa's list of 10 kinds of Upeka. Here we go. Um, So I need the one before that, actually. Uh, bear with me one second. Okay, so here's this list of 10 kinds. Um, I'm sure you'll be with me when you look at this, when I say I've bitten off a lot to chew here, and I'm going to have to try to be very succinct um, and just try to pick out salient points as I go through. And maybe not just, you know, not do it in this order either. But first of all, we have something called sixfold equanimity, which I found quite intriguing. Six, six factored equanimity, sometimes it's called. Then we have uh, equanimity as a Brahma Vihara, as a Bojanga, equanimity of energy, equanimity about formations. Equanimity is a type of feeling, I think we're all familiar with, but we'll cover it. Equanimity about insight. Equanimity as specific neutrality. Sounds a bit technical, um, what's that? And equanimity of jhana and equanimity of purity. So this is his list. Um, and then he goes on to say that, um, that actually, 
of these all these kinds. Number sixfold, Brahma Vihara Bojanga, specific neutrality, jhana and purity are really all one of the, of the same kind of upeka. They are the same kind of upeka, but they are different in that they uh, ar they arise. It, it's an upeka that arises in many different contexts with different functions. Um, so, for example, you couldn't say you couldn't have equanimity of jhana as a six, one of the sixfold equanimity. You couldn't have um, bojanga as um, one of the Brahma Viharas. It's just, they, they just don't, they're not the same in that sense. And then two of the on the list, number four and number six, equanimity of energy and the types of feeling, they are separate from all the others and from each other. So they are not like anything else. And then the, the equanimity about formations and about insight, they are another uh, pair. In fact, they go together, but as Gosa said, they, you know, they really are two stages in the, in the same process. So what I did was pick them out and put them like this to let you have a look at that. <clears throat> Now, so what's this sixfold equanimity? Let's have a look at that for starting point. Um, this is about equanimity in relation to all the senses, all the physical senses, sight, sound, hearing, um, taste, touch, uh, smell, and mind. Um, holding equanimity in relation to all those. So let's have a look at the example that's given to us to, um, to illustrate this. It comes from the Anguttara Nikaya. Having seen a form with the eye, a bhikkhu is neither joyful nor saddened, but dwells equanimous, mindful, and clearly comprehending. Couple of oh, so then that that phrase is repeated in that sort of for each one of the different senses, um, you know. And we have. I just want to point out, just while we're looking at this, that really wherever upeka um, shows up, really wherever there's equanimity, there is always also mindfulness and clear comprehension. They they're always there. Um, so Buddha Gosa goes on to tell us that um, this is a mind purged of all the intoxicants. Um, we can see it. It's a very, it's a state of pure mental liberation, really. It's a totally unshakable mind, the mind of an arahant. This is where we are with this particular one. Um, and it makes it clear that it is the mind of an arahant. Moved on and about all of all of the things that get in the way, all the all the um, the defilements, if you like, have been abandoned, all of them. And um, and he goes on to say, um, with this mind, there is the non-abandonment of the pure original state. When the six objects, whether desirable or undesirable, are presented at the six doors. Okay, so I'll, I'll come back now. Pure and pure original state. It reminds me of another saying the Buddha said elsewhere the mind is luminous, but it gets covered over with defilements. Um, this is a mind where all the defilements are now being removed. We have a state of purity. And, you know, this thing about purity, purity, purifying is something that comes up time and again whenever there is opaque present. This is the, we're really at the, the you know, the, the, the end of the, the journey here. We're at the end of the, the goal has been reached. But this isn't just relevant to the mind of a Buddha. Because where we, we see elsewhere in another sutta, um, the Buddha talks about equanimity of the senses, 
as it rises in the mind of an ordinary worldling and as it arises in the mind of somebody who is a renunciant, who is developing themselves, their spiritual self. Um, and for an ordinary worldling, um, it, it's really just to do with the feeling base of the, of the, of the, um, the object of sense. So if we just remind ourselves that with every uh, contact between uh, one of our senses and an object of sense, like in this case, a visible object, being perceived by the sense, sensory organ of the eye and then um, sensory consciousness advert into that, we have contact. And every time there is a contact of that kind um, at the sense door, there is going to be a feeling. Um, either it's going to be um, pleasant, unpleasant, or neither pleasant or unpleasant. And when this equanimity arises in the mind of a, a regular, you know, just an ordinary worldling who isn't, hasn't come across the Dharma, isn't working uh, to, uh, hasn't seen any danger in this at all, um, it only happens where there is neither. Uh, pleasant or unpleasant feeling is just because of the features of the net, of the object itself, and he says this is a, an ignorant kind of upeka. Whereas for the renunciant who has been developing their mind gradually over time and looking into um, the rise and fall of of all you know, all formations and cessation and all those things that we look at when we look at Dukkha and Anicca and, and, and Anatta, and starting to see the danger in all this. But um, when the equanimity arises for that person, it's not to do so much with the features of the object, but it comes from an inner quality that transcends the object and remains with whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, but in, in an equanimous state. So quite fascinating, really. Um, but I thought at this point, to just sort of look at why this might be even important, um, to just remind ourselves um, of, um, just let's go and have an, a look at our... Um, Yeah, the, our chart of dependence origination. I've blown it up so we can see it better. So here we are. There it is. It's all there. But I'm only interested in this part here for today. The uh, where this is about the, the 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 wheel of samsara, the way beings get caught up, and it is a complete. It's all. It really just goes on and on, repeating over over a lifetime after lifetime. And uh, just a quick reminder, as the, the start of each new uh, being being born, it comes from uh, really ignorance because we just haven't seen things the way they are. We, we get caught up and we're caught up in this, in this thing. We come into a new life and it, it's the karma formations, all our karma from past lives uh, is dictating which life we come into. Um, we have consciousness, we have uh, uh, nama rupa, we have um, uh, materiality and mentality, and we have the six sense bases coming into the body. Um, and then, when, as I said, whenever the six percent, one of the six sense bases comes into contact with an object and consciousness is adverted to it, we have here contact. That's contact, and every time there's contact, there's Vedana, there's a feeling base to it. And this is where beings get caught up. The next thing that happens is craving, because we like it, we want a bit more of that. Or we don't like it, we want to push it away. And that can crystallize over time into attachment, very quickly actually, you know, we get attached to things. Once we're attached to something, then we see that uh, we're creating new karma over it. It's the, it's the activity of the mind and we have more coming and so on. Da, da, da. 
But here is that one little window of opportunity where feeling arises that if we are more in control of that, we have an opportunity to not go there, not do that, not allow that to happen. And so it has a very important place in the teaching, this kind of thing. Okay, so um, just one other important thing to say about this, that the Buddha said, yes, um, when this happens, it is not about turning away from the object. It's not about trying not to be involved in, um, in, in what comes up with the senses. Um, it's about being absolutely present and completely clear about what's there. Okay, so, uh, you know, in one sutta you met a Jane who was practicing equanimity of the, sutta, of the senses and asked him how he does it. And he says, no, I, I just try and have nothing to do with the senses. But no, not that at all. Um, Buddha makes very clear in that sutta to Ananda that it's not that. So we're talking about this ability to abide, to be in the presence of unpleasant uh, experienced through the senses and unpleasant, but yet nevertheless maintain a middle ground, maintain a neutrality of mind that is not about neutrality of feeling, but it's about the mind which transcends whatever's there and is able to remain um, steady. So when we look, moving from this to Rupeka as a Brahma Vihara, we can see that there is a, it's the same kind of upeka, but a, just a different focus, a different object. We're not talking about the senses there. We're talking about beings and our relationship to beings. And it's coming from a base of metta towards all beings. Um, upeka emerges there as the fourth of the Brahma Viharas. And it is, again, that ability to remain with whatever is in an undisturbed mind. So you go through the, the stages of metta, and it, that is so important as the base for all of this, um, where the mind turns to, see suffering, it turns to... Um, compassion and where it, it sees goodness or the results of goodness in the way of somebody having good fortune because that's to do with their past, past karma anyway. It's all to do with goodness. Turns to that with joy. Those two are there present and then upeka arises as a, as a, a, a perfect balance between the two. And there again you see this kind of neutrality of mind that is able to be present, not turning away. Sometimes that's called indifference, but it's not a very useful definition, really. Many writers have said that because it, 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 it creates a, 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 perhaps an impression that it's about um, disinterestedness, um, turning away, or, or, what's it got to do with me kind of mind, you know, it's not my problem. Or I don't want to look at that disinterestedness. It's not that. It is, um, in the words of Bhikkhu Bodhi, he says, it both consummates and perfects the first three, and it doesn't negate them either. But it's all there. It's all still there, but there is this mind present with it all. Like climbing to the top of a hill and looking over and being able to see the whole of the landscape in every Every, every, every uh, uh, way, every, uh, from every angle, and take it all in equally, with no preference and no bias. So we can see we've got two kinds of upeka here that are behaving. You know, they're very much the same kind of upeka, but in different contexts. Um, and. I think it would be nice, actually, at this point, if we did a chant and we just chanted the, um, um, the spread in the Brahma Viharas. So um, I just have a look at who's here. Um, and 
I wonder, Mark, Mark Rowlands, would you would you lead that chant, please? Under my young Brahma Vihara Paranam Karoma Se Ahang Sukito Homi Niduko Homi Awero Homi Abya Pajo Homi Anigo Homi Suki Atanang Pariharami Sabe Sata Sukita Hontu Sabe Sata Awera Hontu Sabe Sata Abya Paja Hontu Sabe Sata Aniga Hontu Sabe sata suki atanang pariharantu. Sabe sata sabaduka pamuchantu. Sabe sata lada sampatito ma vigachantu. Sabe sata kamasaka. Kamadaya da kamayoni, kamabandu kamapati sarana, yang kamang karisanti, kalianang wa papakang wa, tasadaya da bawisanti. Thank you, Mark. One of the, um, well, the, the literal translation of Upeka is looking on. And we've seen that already in two uh, kinds of Upeka here, looking on. So just a looking on. Um, and we're going to turn now to um, Upeka as a Brahma Vihara. Uh, sorry, as a Bojanga. Um, and I think really to, before looking at that, I'd like to move to that um, number eight on the list, which was the specific neutrality, that rather technical sounding one. Um, I'll just share a screen here. Um, Okay, there's a word that's used for that, which means it's tatra majatata. It means there in the middleness. Um, you can see maja there in the middle of the word. Very, very useful. It's um, it's a it's a synonym of of uh, upeka, but it's holding the middle hold. There being there in the middleness is really what Upeka is all about. And um, this um, specific neutrality, this neutrality of mind, um, it's Buddha Gosa makes it clear that we're really talking about, um, first of all, this is a, 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 the, this, this is a, one of the universal Ch um, it that means it's a mind state, a universal always arises every time the mind is in a skillful state. Um, and it has um, an impact. Um, it balances coexisting states equally. Also, um, it has the char characteristic of conveying consciousness and the mental factors equally. So whatever the mind, the, the consciousness is there and all the things related with it, all the states there, conveying them, all those factors equally, 
and it prevents deficiency and excess. So that is um, a mind state, a universal mind state that arises whenever the, the mind is in a, a, a skillful state. There's no greed, no hatred present. It is desireless. There's no uh, attachment going on and there's no pushing away. So um, again, this is the one. This is the this is the basis of all those first all those six. Why they're all the same kind? It's that kind of mind. And in as a as a bojanga, you know, we let's look at it. We have mindfulness, dhamma, um, energy, effort, energy, bigger, rapture, um, uh, tranquilization, samadhi, concentration, and then upeka. It's there at the sort of climax of the apex of everything, you know, but it doesn't arise on its own. And the whole process begins with uh, mindfulness. Mindfulness leads the way. Um, and is present throughout every stage of the development of those um, bojangas, isn't it? So that we, you know, and um, and and we're taught that um, each one arises independent of the one before. And so, um, you know, you have the very strong mindfulness that then leads to the arising, the arousal of of the wisdom. Uh, the, the insight, the searching into, which is Dhamma Vichaya, and the, at this level, it's very much the wisdom base. Um, and that quality of, uh, of energy that stands there with keeping it all going and so on. Those side, that's kind of like a Vipassana side, and we have on the other side, kind of like um, we would say that this is the Samasa side, where it's all coming up naturally as uh, more instinctual, more in, more coming up from the heart, um, but they they held in balance, and it's really it's really mindfulness that holds that balance throughout. But when opaca arises, and this is a process that goes over and over, because working with developing and perfecting all of these factors, but ultimately when they are all developed to the point of being enlightenment factors the mind is ready ready to go towards enlightenment and upeka arises there it arises every time you know when we're working with this but here now when it arises we're told uh, with a mind thus concentrated um, it, it looks on with equanimity but it's also really Everything about this whole process is there within that, you know. All the virtue, all the sila that led to the ability to even start this journey in the first place is in there. All of this wisdom that's been seen, all the, the real understanding and the purification of knowledge is there. All of the, the calming and the, you know, it, it's all there. And, um, and the, it, there is this opaque of neutrality of mind uh, has to be there like that has to be like that I'm told from some of the readings I've done um, that to turn now to make the change from the mundane world that we live in change of lineage into the in, in, in onto the path in the um, need that that purity of mind. And it's said that um, in the Dhammasangani, that when that happens and the path does arise, um, all the Bojangas are present as the mind states are all there, but they're in complete harmony. None are in it, none are, have got more strength than others. They are completely in harmony. And this is the power of Upeka there. Um, so, I think it would be nice to just chant the first verse of the Bojangas now. Um, so could I ask um, Gareth, would you would you chant the the first verse of the Bojangas on page 30, please? Oh. 
Bhujango Sati Sankato Dhamma Nang Vichayo Tata Viryam Piti Pasadi Bhujanga Chatata Pare Samadupekka Bhujanga Sate te sapata sina munina samada kata bhavita bhavuli kata sangvatanti abhinaya nibana yachaburiya Etena satchavadena soti teho tusapata. I was thinking about the Bojang, the factor of enlightenment that's opaque. It, it just makes me think it is like an, it just is the middle way, you know, it is the middleness, being in the middleness. Um, that is the meaning of Tatra Majata. It is being in the middleness. And, and it's just beautiful, really. I, I just loved that uh, word and, and that meaning. But you'll see that there are so many different definitions of equanimity the kind of trying to get to it, you know, we need all the, and so I'm trying to bring them in and explain what, what they, what I understand they mean. Um, okay, so um, just a very quick word about this equanimity of energy, uh, the one that stands alone, it's not like anything else. It's, we know this one, it's just the energy, the, the balance of energy that we need when we're balancing the the, um, the spiritual faculties of uh, faith and wisdom and, uh, and mindfulness and concentration, um, we're told that it's like tuning up uh, a, a string instrument. Tune the, the strings too tight and you get a jarring sound. Tune too loosely and it's going to lead to, you know, it's just not going to be a pure sound. And just like that with the, with the uh, balancing here. Um, too much effort, too much energy leads to agitation. Too much, not enough leads to laxity. And so, you know, um, that's really all that one is about. The teaching that was given to a monk called Sona, who was a lute player, who was working far too hard on his practice that he became very disillusioned. And it was at the point of giving up when the Buddha, out of compassion, came and gave him that teaching. And of course, he went on to be enlightened, <laughs> become an arahant later on. So I just want to move now to um, the two... Um, Equanimity of formation and equanimity of um, insight, the two that the Buddha Gosa said, they're just two parts of the same process. We don't have a lot of time and it's a big subject, but I'm going to use a little simile that Buddha Gosa gave, which I think is lovely and it just gets to the point really. And so it goes like this. <clears throat> A snake gets into somebody's a man's house towards the close of day, um, and the man, realizing this, takes up a stick with a, with a, a shape like the, the the hoof of a goat, so it's sort of like cloven shape, and he goes sit, searching through the house to find the snake, and then he sees it lying on a pile of husks. But in the dim light, he's peering and peering. And is it the snake or is it not the snake? Is it, is it not? And then he sees three stripes, the three stripes on the snake's neck. And at that point, all doubt goes. He's seen, he's found the snake. The search is over. And this is uh, compared to 
the point at which um, so the seer who's working with their insight work comes to see the reality of the three characteristics of, of D Dukkha, uh, Anicca and Anatta. And this, it's seen, it's seen, sees the truth of the, the noble truth, and then the search is over. That's equanimity of insight. No need to search anymore. But now our snake, snake finder find, takes his stick and he seizes onto the snake and goes through a process of thinking, oh, I've got to get rid of this now. How do I get rid of it without hurting it or hurting myself, getting stung? Um, and this is like the process that follows where having seen those three characteristics, the truth of that, peering at that truth sees the danger and the fearfulness in it and it's like it's all on fire reminds me of the the fire sermon at this point um and doesn't want to hold doesn't want to be hold, seized it doesn't want to be holding on to that anymore it's that that turning of the mind towards liberation of the desire to be freed from it um that then comes to equanimity of formations. And that's the two aspects of those two put together in that little simile. At that point, the mind is ready, as we took, looked at before, to move towards um, the change of, limited, of, uh, of um, lineage with Gotrabu into the, into the enlightenment. And to, well, at that point, it would be the stream winner. Um, so this just leaves me now with the two remaining ones, which are about back to jhana and then purification. And again, because of today's time, I'm going to be succinct and quick with it. Um, but I am, again, going to use a lovely and a really quite delightful simile that Buddha Gosa used for this as well. Um, so what he was explaining, what he explains is that when, um, when, one is, when, when one goes into the practice and is able to let go of the hindrances, they've been abandoned and the mind goes into first jhana, there is upeka present there, but it's very, very fine, and it's not apparent. Um, it's like almost like it's latent um, because of the, the activity of the mind is so focused on Vitaka Vichara at that point that it cannot be, um, it's not apparent. And then again, going into second jhana, where Vitaka and Vichara are put down, there's still Upeka there under the surface, but um, the, the, the rapture, the, the, the piti that's arising there and the great, the great energization that can be present, again, is um, obscuring any kind of awareness of it. A Buddha Gosa says it's like the moon is always in the sky at daytime. It's there, but we cannot see it because of the, um, the glare of the sun obscuring it. Um, but when the mind moves to third jhana, then Upeka raises his head, so to speak, and we begin to see its power. And it's like the light is dimming. We can see uh, it is there. Um, the phrase that's often used is equanimous and mindful. He abides with blissful ease. And the mindfulness is very strong now. It's holding the mind there, not, not, go, not wanting to go back to the rapture, keeping it steady. And there is just a very pleasant happiness that can be felt in the body, but a very blissful state, as we, you know, 
we know about all this from our, our jhana work. And, um, and a, a peka is present there in the balance of it, because there's no movement one way or the other. Almost like it's the, but there is this happiness. And it's, so it's like the last vestiges maybe of a kind of, of a, just a movement of the mind because of that small attachment to that depth of, of happiness that's there. It has to be let go of though to move on. And when it is, let go of. And the mind moves to fourth jhana, then, um, as we know, um, a kagata, one pointedness arises. My, the uh, samadhi is completely absorbed. There is no movement of any kind. There's, and it's always pointed out, emphasized. There's no, there's no pleasure or pain in this. However, that's just to emphasize there's no movement whatsoever. And we, we can see this as the moon completely now, luminous in the sky, and nothing overpowering it. It is there, fully present. And that state of mind, where mindfulness is so, so um, well-developed and so pure, the purity of it is said to come from nothing else but Upeka. And Upeka here is defined, I love this definition, the zero point between joy and sorrow. Uh, so there's really no movement at all. It's really very uh, descriptive, isn't it? Um, so that brings us to, it's, it's a paper that purifies the mind. And the mind is then very malleable, very soft, very open, very sensitive, can move easily into the arupa jhanas from there, even putting away the form of the nimitta, and can also begin the work, of, is ready really to look at the work of insight, wisdom work, um, and the balance is there between samatha and vipassana in that little place. Um, so I would now say that that is my talk. I think I've covered them all really with a little whistle stop tour. Um, but if you would um, just indulge me for a moment more, because when I first started on this uh, looking into Paker, the 10 kinds, um, my first response was quite playful, and um, I wrote a, a, a lot of little haikus for each kind, which was quite quite good to do because I had to kind of pin down in, in a structure that's very tight what it was. Um, and those haikus are, uh, some of them are pretty need, need refining now because my understanding has moved on, uh, a bit more refined. But, um, so I'm not going to bore you with them all, but I would just like to use the ones that I put together when I was looking at um, the jhanas and the purification. So I'll just share those with you if I, if I may. Oh, this next one is an image I found of the Buddha, in, uh, sorry, in the, the moon in its, its full luminosity. Um, Reminded me of the snow moon we had the other night, and I just wanted to capture something of it. Um, so here, my equanimity of jhana. Abiding in bliss, quietly detached, one sits with equanimity. At fourth jhana, when happiness subsides, with one-pointedness you rise, like the rising of the moon, upeka, revealed in full radiance. And then on to the last one about purification. Strong mindfulness yokes the mind. Equanimity then purifies it. And I think we've seen something of that in every kind of uh, equanimity that we've, that's been looked at in the 10 kinds. Um, that's the end of my talk, and I'd be very happy to 
you know, if anyone's got any comments or questions, um, to open it up. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, that was absolutely lovely. Really lovely. Um, the question I have, while it's still fresh in my mind, is when the man found the snake, I completely understood about the th three signs, but the next bit of it, I could see the danger of it, but the next bit of it, I couldn't quite get to how he went from there to not getting caught up in the danger. Uh, yes, yes, I understand, of course. And it's, it, is, it is quite a detailed, there are nine stages to that part. Um, and I've just made a decision not to try and cover them all, but really, right. it goes a bit like this. Um, you know, having seen the, the formations, the rising, falling, seeing the aggregates of self, seeing that there is nothing to hold on to in any of it, that it's all transient it's, and in every realm and in every, everywhere, it's just all comes to cessation. Um, then he sees the danger and the, the fear in holding on to that, which is holding on to the snake with the, you know, that's the analogy there. Um, and the, the process moves towards, um, first of all, wanting to not hold on to that anymore, not hold, wanting to turn to escape from it, liberation from this state, this can always being in this state. And, um, and then the disenchantment from it, that's the, the next phase, just becoming completely disenchanted. We don't have that in the simile. We don't get to that bit. It's the equanimity of not wanting to hold on to it anymore that was covered by formations there. Yeah. But then yeah. we, but then the mind, few moments moves to equanimity where everything becomes very balanced very neutralized and readiness for the move on to, um, to the next stage, which is Gotrabu, which is the preparation of the mind for change of lineage. So if that's the kind of process. There'd be people here who could explain that much better than me, but uh, that's how I understood it. Thank, so, you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I see mindfulness seems to be the core of for all the factors and for the equanimity, mm. it's there in every stage, mm. in every factor, that seems to be the main thing I feel. Mm. Mm. Yes. Without the mindfulness, the others don't exist. Yes. Mm. And is that the purification underneath it all, you know, that we came to in the first one, the, the mind not, not abandoning that original pure, pure, pure state is, is, a, is something lovely to hold in mind, I think, when we're thinking of that Upeka. Mm. Mute yourself. Thanks. Yes, yeah, thank you. Eileen, what a wonderful, wonderful way to, to start the day. And uh, there was so much warmth. And um, anyway, well, for me, it was absolutely beautiful. And um, what I really, really took away from, from your talk was the fact that Upeka isn't something cold oh, and, so and frosty and, or, and sort of lacking in, in feeling, which is what I always imagine. It's sort of slightly aloof with everything and you explain so beautifully that it's about fully realizing mm -hmm. all the qualities having them there but not being caught on them yes. and, and i really appreciated that and i will take that away so thank you for a very lovely talk really lovely <laughs> thank you very much liz uh, i'm glad you said that because you know so many people when we started at the beginning of the pandemic, um, we, uh, yeah, um, we, we've done a lot of Brahma Vihara work, haven't we? And because, you know, just because of the sheer amount of suffering that's going on out there, it was a, a, a natural response and a good response. 
And so we've looked at this quite a bit, but I remember more than once people saying, individuals saying, how do I do that though? And is it even right to be, have a paker in the face of so much suffering? As if it's a kind of uh, a ignoring of it, of, of just being not interested in it. And you, you, you know, that's what you, you, you've raised there. And it's really important to, to know that it's not that. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, partly related to that. Uh, you mentioned indifference, and I think Buddha Goza says that's the near enemy of equanimity. It's exactly. kind of similar, but it's different from it. And on what you were saying about equanimity and the epidemic, you know, uh, if you think of a Brahma who had great love and kindness, compassion, and etc., uh, such a character, if they knew about what was going in the world, would certainly need equanimity too. Yes. <laughs> But the other thing is, a question, can you have too much equanimity? Because on the Bojangas, Buddha Goza says, you know, if you've got a lot of the calming side, equanimity, tranquility, concentration, you might need a bit more on the energy and joy side. And yes, 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 definitely. Yeah, um, no, yeah, th that balance that's needed between the two sides I didn't really cover it, but yes, it has to be there. And mm -hmm. I, I was what I was trying to say was, is it, if you have strong mindfulness, it keeps that. It will help with keeping that in place as well. Because if we get too caught on one side, we, oh. you know, we start. We can we can even start sort of getting um, aversion to, uh, yeah. to the work because it's just exhausting, or it's just you know to the mind work, or it's just revealing too much too fast or whatever um and but not but on the other side knowing when 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 we're really working with um the the the, the calm side uh, effectively and, and and moving very in a very balanced way between the two excess and laxity same as in the, the one with the energy isn't it that, that those two things have to be held in place yes you can have too much equanimity I guess um, if it's just sort of like being and why would we don't need to be in equanimity all the time either I mean in the Brahma Viharas it's not instead of mm -hmm. you know one moves between yeah. and it is a state that can be held but it's not better than everything else it is I, I guess to... I guess you need equanimity about equanimity not you do isn't it interesting that you should say that? Because actually, the Pali Text Society translated that specific neutrality as equanimity about equanimity. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I was I pondered it for so long. I thought, oh, I like that. Does it mean uh, that when you've got equanimity, don't get attached to it? I think it probably does. Yeah, um, yeah. You can get attached to anything, you know. So. Uh, so and sometimes we need to move off it move back to something else yeah mm -hmm. shift our weight to the other foot it is and and the other thing that the Pali text society always uses indifference for upeka and i it doesn't it and it doesn't point out that it, it's not you know but it, but our, i think it's the word that um i mean okay you could say it's indifference but you have to understand in what way it's indifferent. There isn't difference in it. Oh. Indif indifference is there, equanimity is there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it leads to so much um, misunderstanding and gives it a really bad press, I think. Hmm. Yeah, anyone else? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Eileen. Um, I don't think I realised there was so, so much written about equanimity, so thank you for that. And obviously shared from experience, which comes over so well in your, in your talk. Uh, my points, uh, just a comment, similar to Liz's really, what the, the two phrases I picked up as really being heartfelt for me was when you said neut neutrality of mind, but not neutrality of feeling. And that, to me, really sort of, yeah. the essence of it and also the other point was um 
the zero point between joy and sorrow. I think that's just <laughs> so deep and so lovely. So thank you for that. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I, can I just say that one, one definition, another definition that you get coming up in here and there is it means hedonic neutrality. And um, actually that is supposed to be the definition that describes the state of mind that is able to be, enjoy, enjoy an object without getting caught up on its desirableness or its undesirableness. Um, there are so many definitions and you come across them and think, what does that mean? But actually, when you look at it, you think, okay, it's pointing at that aspect, you know? Um, and I just think opaques like that. There need to be loads of definitions to really get to the bottom of what. But exactly, the, the zero point does it for me every time. Any more? Um, guys, next, please. Yeah. And then Veronica. Well, I partly wanted to echo what everyone else has said, which is thank you very much for such a lovely and inspiring talk. Um, I also wanted to mention or ask about something that occurred to me, which is the sort of difficulty of carrying equanimity into challenging situations in real life. You know, <laughs> I think we've probably all had the experience we go to Green Street, say, and the sun's shining, we've got very good company, we've had a nice meal, yeah. everything is perfect. We sit down and, um, you know, I, I certainly occasionally feel I'm really getting somewhere with this equanimity and, you know, brightness, etc. And then um, I usually travel up there by public transport and I, by the time I get back to London and get on the tube in the rush hour or something, I'm a sort of snarling mess, you know, kicking people out of the way. I'm, I'm kind of brought back down to earth if I'm getting any ideas about, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, you know when the six senses are bringing in things that are challenging, you know, it, it, yeah. it, it then becomes much harder. I, I know yeah. maintaining mindfulness, we've mentioned already, I suppose, yeah. is something yeah. to, to remember, but I, I just wondered if you could say something about that, please. Right, um, very good, um, and, and exactly, and, you know, let's not forget that this, it, it isn't easy, and this is, no, it, none of this is what we're supposed to be doing all the time, we just can't, we can do it when we can, when we are able to, when our mind is in a state able to, and gradually, gradually, we, we get better at, at it, or we're in the right conditions like at Green Street. So many times at Green Street, I've been there a few days and then my boomer will say in the evening, and what is your favorite um, uh, dharma to now, you know? And it, I think, oh, Upeka, you know, but it's not like that, is it, in real life, every day when we're, we're pulled about with, especially if you're in working situations, and we all we can do is try to maintain mindfulness as best we can, and perhaps guard the sense doors a bit, so that we, we, we try, a bit like, you know, the four right efforts where we just try not to get caught up in unwholesomeness. Um, but I think the key point here is that we go back to the first of the Bojanga, uh, the, uh, the Brahma Viharas. We need to give ourselves loving kindness. And that needs to be um, unconditional. You know, we accept all of that. That's what it. That's where I am right now. Uh, no judgment on it, you know. Just keep, just keep trying. It's okay. Everything's okay. We need to be easy with all this. We, it, we can't just do it. You can't do opaca, you know, and just bring it out of thin air. <laughs> but we have. We might have some little uh, strategies of our own that help us. And certainly, going back to the breath bring back mindfulness. It's always a help, isn't it? For me, anyway. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Thank you, Eileen. Um, it was very inspiring. And, and there were a number of things that uh, helped to clarify, rather like um, other people have said, actually, um, a few things. Certainly when you describe the jhana 
process it was so alive really in in, in just taking us through that it it, it clarified um the, the things that we've experienced ourselves. Um, uh, what, what came up for me was that phrase that was right there at the beginning when I sort of embarked on the path. You know, I, w- I wonder if I've moved over. I don't know that phrase you use, changing lineage. There's certain moments when somehow you, you go forward in your thinking and your feeling. It's seeing reality as it truly is. And that was right at the beginning that this path will enable you to see reality as it truly is. And there have been times when I've thought that that reality is the most beautiful, uh, radiant sort of aliveness. Mm. And, then, and then other times I thought, no, it's the opposite. It's like, um, mm. it's just a den of <laughs> vipers or whatever. <laughs> mm. phrase, you know. Um, and both are true. And somehow when you have the perception and the feeling and the, and, and the sort of wish to, to know um, reality as it truly is. It could be very boring. It could be mundane. And, but I'd certainly that seeking for reality as it truly is. But in your talk, it sort of came alive very much that sense that um, the point, as everyone else has spoken, has mentioned, of sort of balance, of cent- middleness, it means that there is the beauty and the horror um, equally uh, uh, true Um, but being not backing off and seeing it that's not wisdom actually being slightly separated it's actually being in the midst of it somehow without falling into despair or elation or something of those lines and how important how important that is um, the balance Um, so that that's sort of theoretical but I can relate it yeah uh, experience and, and certainly as we get into this phase of life you know some of us uh, we're gonna need it uh, to face old age sickness and death <laughs> you know really really that's the answer uh, if only we can uh, you know strengthen it and uh, and feel it and, and and really bring it into being when we can so thank you very much for that Heidi and clarifying it. So I don't think there's a question there. Maybe much more perhaps what you think. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I, I can I there's something that's just come into my mind when you're saying that. It's one of the things that um the Buddha taught to Ananda about how to get to this equanimity. And I when I read it I thought, oh I don't know about that. And it goes it goes like this, something like this. Um when there's um an undesirable object, see it as beautiful. And if there's a desirable object, see it as undesirable. Or see it as ugly. See ugliness as beautiful. To, and, and, I'm, and, you know, and then see them both as ugly. And see them both as beautiful. And it, there's a kind of third part where you drop the... The, the labels and just sort of slip into them. Now, when I first came across that, I wondered whether to bring it into my talk, but it w- I thought it would take too long. But uh, it really reminded me of, because I suddenly thought, actually, it's not that hard it's, it, it's to do that. There have been times when I've seen that. But it's always, always on retreat, isn't it? But um, I remember being on retreat one year where... But, um, there was a lot of dukkha about. Uh, people had just had things happening in their lives. And Nai Booman, uh, when he'd ask, what's your favourite dhamma? People would say, some people would say dukkha. And um, he'd say, dukkha, dukkha? Quite normal, you know. Um, say thank you to your dukkha. There's no sukkha without dukkha. And he just kept going back and forth. No sukkha without dukkha. Say thank you to your dukkha. And it seemed ridiculous at the time, very funny. But actually, I worked with that throughout the rest of the retreat, and it really was helpful. Um, I had at the time, I got some very itchy skin because I'd been in the sun too much, and it kept waking me up at night. And um, and I'd wake and I'd be lathering myself with itch cream and all this business, and um, 
And then I'd wake up with it in the night after that. And I remember thinking, thank you to my dukkha. It sounds silly, but, and it just seemed to dissolve. I just was able to go back to sleep. And it's something about changing your mindset. Mm. Yeah? Yeah. There's something about that. Um, And also just, um, yeah, just moving between the two seems to get you there as well. I don't know, there's something interesting about that. (laughs) Yes, it comes down to basics sometimes, doesn't it? Just a small thing. I remember going into a report with Nine Boonman and he just looked at me for a while and he said, you need a lot of upeka in Bangkok traffic. I think I just had one comment, Eileen. Uh, Mm. Kind of the most, the thing struck me most, and although I kind of, I intellectually understood it, I think what amazed me was the upeka is seeing everything as it is, but not turning away. Mm. You know, it's not aversion to the attachment. It's a, I just try and imagine what's the kind of strength and of mind that is required to abide gracefully mm-hmm. with full, full awareness of everything that's going on. So experiencing the full joy and the full dukkha, the horror, beauty and horror, as mentioned before, and not but being you know, unswayed. It's very, uh, it's a very powerful image. What came to mind is standing in a, in a full torrent of a stream, or if you've ever stood under a waterfall mm-hmm. and it's hitting you on the head, it's both joyous and terrifying at the same time, but not being swayed at all by that feeling yeah. Um, yeah. is, I suppose, the mental equivalent of that is what, Maybe, as you say, it's, it's difficult to practice, but to become aware of it, it's almost like knowing where you are within that frame of reference yeah. it is a big help. I think mm. so. And just being, and just being, you know, honest with yourself and just being okay with where you are, you know. And we, if we expect to be able to do these amazing things and we can't do them, um, my goodness, then aversion and attachment of a different kind comes up, doesn't it? Because we start feeling judging and all sorts. It's, it's really a standard. You know, the first one we looked at, the, the, the mind of an arahant, is a kind of beautiful standard that you can know is possible. Um, but, and even that, I think, helps, you know, to bring to mind, really. Yeah. But yes, it is hard to imagine, you know, in one's death throes. <laughs> well, we don't know till we get there. <laughs> yeah. I'd like everyone to, at the end of the blessing, just unmute and we'll do one big joyous sadhu. Bhavati Sabha Mangalangra Kanti Sabha Devata. Saba good hard and bowing as the dust for tea, bow one to day. Bowati Saba Mangalangra Kanti Saba Devata Saba Dhamma, and bowing as the dust for tea, bow one to day. Bowati Saba Mangalangra Kanti Saba Devata. Thank you.